Hello, good morning everyone. Just another broadcast today, continuing chapter 1 of Isaiah. There's a lot to go through. Um, I just want to pray before we start. Lord, I thank you that you are here with us. Lord, as we study your word, help us to learn something more about you, Lord. And Lord, also learn more about ourselves, Lord, and the hidden things in us that you want us to reveal, so that they may be taken out of us, so that we might walk in you, Lord, and we might know your heart, and we might truly know what it is to be humble before you, Lord, and holy before you. So help us today as we study your word. Help us to take something from each of these broadcasts that we can use in everyday life. Lord, the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Lord, but faith without works is dead as well, Lord. We've got to put what we learn into practice. So help us to do that as we study your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last time I did a broadcast, we worked, we read up into chapter 1 and verse 11. And today we're going to start at verse 13. It seems an odd place to start, but we took such a long time in the introduction and looking at what was going on at the time. So let's read from verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who hath inquired this at your hand? Who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity even the solemn meeting. Your moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make your prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool, as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse or rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. The silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. The princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Every one loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the father, lest neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease my ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. And I will turn my hand upon thee and purge away the dross and take away thy tin. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. If you're good and you're upright before God you will be blessed and you will reap the harvest to say in O unto the wicked it shall be ill with him for the reward of his hand shall be given him all his consequences to our actions if we're obedient we receive blessing if we're disobedient we receive judgment as for my people children are their oppressors and women rule over them O my people they will lead thee they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy path. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten upon the vineyard, and the spoil of the poor in your own houses. What me mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces, and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? Moreover the Lord saith, Behold the daughter of Zion, a haughty, and walk with outstretched, stretched, well, walk with stretched forth necks, and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Sounds like arrogance and pride to me there, showing off as they go along. 
Therefore the Lord will smite with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will devour their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their cows and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and fine linen and the hoods and veils. That describes the type of people they were dressed up, their bells on, their jewellery all over their body, piercings and everything else it's saying. And God has no pleasure in any of that. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be a stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent, a, ton, a rent. And instead of well set, their hair, baldness. Instead of a stomacher, a grinding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And a gate shall lament a moan, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Although the people did not feel sorry for their sins, they continued to offer sacrifices for forgiveness. Gifts and sacrifices mean nothing to God when they come from a corrupt heart. God wants us to remove sin from our lives first. After that, he will be pleased with our sacrifices of time and money. 18. A deep stain is virtually impossible to remove from, from cloth, clothing, and the stain of sin seems equally permanent. But God can remove the stain of sin from our lives as he promised to do for the Israelites. We don't have to go through life permanently soiled. If we are willing and obedient, God's word assures us Christ will forgive and remove our worst indelible stains. Psalm 51 verse 1 to 7 I know we read this the other day, but I like this psalm. 51 and verse 7. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from all sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before thee. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Will you ask him to make you clean? Will you ask him to forgive you and to, of all your sins? God gives us plenty of opportunity to do that. But that time will soon end, and you won't have any more chances. Verse 21 and 22. Jerusalem here represents all of Judah. God compares his relationship with his people to marriage. The people had turned from the worship of the true God to worshipping idols. Their faith was detect defective, impure, undiluted. Idolatry, outward or inward, is a spiritual adultery. Breaking our commitment to God in order to love something else Jesus described the people of his day as adulterous, even though they were religiously strict, as the church, we are the bride of Christ. Revelations 19, 7. And by faith we can be clothed in his righteousness. Has your faith become impure or watered down? Ask God to restore it. Keep your devotion to him strong and pure. Verse 25. God promised to refine his people as metal is purged for a, 
in a smelting pot. The process involves melting the metal and skimming off the impure slag until the worker can be, see his own image in the liquid metal. We must be willing to submit to God, allowing him to remove our sin so that we might be, reflect his image. Isaiah often speaks with both the present and the future in mind. He his prophecies do not necessarily apply to one event, but may apply to a series of present and future events. That's how we can apply God's word to our lives today. God still is asking us the same thing. He hates all our religious practices and our stuff. He wants us to be pure and holy before him and come before him in repentance. He doesn't have any pleasure in our festivals and our worship because they've been contaminated by the evil one. You know, um, we celebrate the birth of Christ on the 25th of December. But really, that was the birth of Nimrod. Nimrod, the mighty hunter you could read about, who turned and tried to destroy all the works of of God. You know, there are many other things that we do that God is not always pleased about. He wants us to come out from the world and be separate and to do the things he wants us to do. Throughout history, the oak tree has been a symbol of strength. Ezekiel mentions that groves of oak trees were used as places for idol worship, Ezekiel 6.13. Do you have any symbols of strength and power that rival God? Do you have areas where your love borders on worship? I mean you worship in something else rather than God. Do you have areas where your love borders on worship? Make God your first loyalty. Everything else will fade and burn away. Verse 31. Tow is flax fibres, used as tinder. A spark set to timber ignites a quick, devouring fire. God compares strong men whose evil deeds devour them to burning tinder. Our lives can be destroyed quickly by a small but deadly spark of evil. What potential fire hazards in your life do you need to remove? God is searching us. He's always concerned with the heart of a person and our relationship with him. There's some notes here. Isaiah served as a prophet to Judah from 740 to 681 BC. The climate of the times. Society was in a great upheaval. Doesn't that sound like today? So many things going on in the world at the moment. Wars, rumours of wars, power, famine, pestilence, diseases. Doesn't it sound like everything is in chaos at the moment? Under King Ahaz and King Manasseh, they were the most wicked kings, these were. And they sacrificed idols. Ahaz even sacrificed his own, own children to Dagon and to, to the idols. You know, because he thought it would please his wife, Jezebel. Because she was a priestess of, of evil. She was a witch, as far as we're concerned. The people revolted to idol reverted to idolatry and there was even child sacrifice. The main message although judgment from other nations was inevitable, the people could still have a special relationship with God. Importance of the message Sometimes we must suffer judgment and discipline before we are restored to God. The contemporary prophets of Isaiah were Hosea, 753 BC to 715 BC. Micah, 742, 687 BC. So, you know, there were other prophets prophesying at about this time as well. So God is more concerned about the heart condition of a man than he is on sacrifices and idol worship uh, and, you know, celebration of feasts and things is more is more concerned about a heart and to remove any sin among us otherwise god can't pour out blessings upon us if we not if we don't truly repent and turn from our sins you know the first part of isaiah is judgment it is also poetry 
Chapters 1 to 35, Revelation of the Sovereign on the Throne. The Crown, Chapter 6, The Government of God. A solemn call to the universe to come into the courtroom to hear God's charge against the nations. God's got a charge against the nations. He's got a charge against us where we've been unfaithful to him. And God will bring about judgment. But he is such a patient God. He is still willing for as many as can will come to know him before he brings about that judgment. Before it's too late. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. We must turn to him and make sure we are walking in his way. Not in our own way. Following our own selfish desires and ambitions. But doing what God wants us to do. Serving him with all our heart, soul and being. Shall we carry on into chapter 2? Chapter 2 goes is 22 verses. In this section it talks about preview for the future and Jerusalem. For Judah and Jerusalem. Walk in the light of the Lord is the heading it says here in the Bible I've got. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in that in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow into it. I believe that's the time he's talking about the new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they re be replenished from the east, and as sooth they say as like the Philistines. Telling fortunes and everything like that, it happens in churches and sometimes. You know, that's why God shines his light, like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Their land is also full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is all full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive the, forget the, give them not. This is talking about those who are bowing down to different idols and symbolism and everything else. Enter into the rock, and hide ye in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. You know, you know that look where you think you're better than anybody else? And you, you not, the looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord of the Lord shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that lifteth up, and he shall be brought low. You know, if you're looking for a position, you're looking to be above everybody else, God will bring you low and humble you. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Basha, Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills they are lifted up, and upon every high tower and every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord of alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. 
all about his judgment, yeah, and what's coming in the future. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship in the, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rock and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. See, see that from man, whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? The temple was built on Mount Moriah, highly visible to all the people of Jerusalem. For more on the significance of the chapter, see Second Chronicles 5 verse 1. In the last days, the temple will be attractive not for its architecture and prominence, but because of God's presence and influence. God gave Isaiah the gift of seeing the future. Here God showed Isaiah what, event, what would eventually happen to Jerusalem. Revelation 21 depicts the glorious fulfilment of this prophecy in the new Jerusalem, where also those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed to enter. Is your name written in that book? Have you turned to God in repentance? And if you have, your name's written in that book and you will be allowed to enter. God made a covenant, a promise with his people and will never break it. God's faithfulness gives us hope for the future. Ask God to help you spread his word. Verse 4. We are told here of a wonderful future of peace when instruments of wars will be converted to instruments of farming. We will be taught God's laws and will obey them. We know that one day God will remove all sin that causes war, conflict and disruption. Yet we do not need to wait to obey God. In chapter 2 verse 5 we are encouraged along with Judah to obey God now. He has given us his word for direction and guidance in order to obey him. Some benefits of obedience we will receive only in the future, but we may enjoy some benefits now as we apply God's word to our lives. The Philistines worship Dagon, Ashtaroth and Baal Baalzebub during the more, more sinful periods of their history. The people of Israel worship these heathen gods along with Yahweh God and gave them Hebrew names. Verse 8 to 9, under the reign of evil kings, idol worship flourished in both Israel and Judah. A few good kings in Judah stopped enduring their reign, their reigns. Though very few people worship carved or moulded images today, worshipping objects that symbolise power still goes on. We worship cars, homes, sports stars, celebrities and money. Idol worship is bad because, one, it insults God when we worship something he created rather than worshipping him. Two, it keeps us from knowing and serving God when we put our confidence in anything other than him. Three, it causes us to rely on our own efforts rather than on God. Verse 12, the day of the Lord of hosts is the day of judgment, the time which God will judge both evil and good. That day will come, and we will want a pro we will want a proper relationship with God when it does. Pride, however, will cripple us. God alone must be exalted. Chapter two, verse eleven and seventeen. As the first step to developing that relationship, we must let go of pride and admit how weak we are and how much we need God. Verse 50 to 17, the high tower refers to security based on military fortresses. The ships of Tarsus are commercial trade ships referring to economic prosperity. Pleasant pictures are safe stately pleasure vessels. Nothing can compare or rival the place God must have in our hearts and minds. To place our hope elsewhere is nothing but false pride. Place your confidence in God alone. Put your trust in God and not your confidence in princes. 
See Revelation 6, verse 15 to 17, for a description of the fear of God's enemies in the day of his wrath. The Bible talks of two kinds of fear. In this verse, fear is the panic and peril unbelievers feel at the judgment of God. The right kind of fear means to revere and stand in awe of God. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Those who honour and respect God need not fear God's wrath. Verse 22. People seem very weak when compared to God. They're, under, they're undependable, sinful, and mortal. Often we trust human beings with our lives and our futures instead of trusting the all-knowing God. Beware of people who want you to trust them instead of God. Remember that God only is completely reliable. He is perfect and we can rely on his unfailing love. Psalm 100 verse 5. We'll, we'll read that. There's only a few verses. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And this is the verse that they was referring to. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So if we put our trust completely in God, then we will experience his blessing. But if we turn our backs on him, then obviously we're going to know problems and difficulties. You know, but God is more concerned about our heart, as I keep repeating, than he is for our practices and the things that we do and our actions. He's more concerned about the condition of our heart and our relationship with him. So today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts, the Bible teaches, as in the day of provocation, but turn to God now. Choose ye this day who you will serve. You're either going to serve idols or you're going to serve or worship your car, your, your home, or other things which you put before God, or you will obey him. Proverbs 1, 7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Where are you at today? Do you trust the Lord? Do you rely on him, or do you rely on the works that you've done with your hands? Do you rely on your own strength? Because I know... His strength will keep us going. Our strength will fail. We are weak human beings. And we can be so dragged away by temptations and the sins of the world. But today, let us turn to the Lord and he will hear us. Let us turn our hearts over to him and let us know what God has for us. So that we might be poor and holy in his sight. And he might have pleasure in our worship and our sacrifices that we make for him in obeying him. Well, that's the message for today. I read a bit more than I planned, but we still had the time. So let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we can turn to you. Help us to turn away from our idols and the things that we were put in place of worshipping you and to worship you with pure, holy hearts, to put God first in our lives Lord, help us to put you first in everything. Because, Lord, if we do everything in our own strength, it's going to fail. But if we put our trust in God, you will never fail. He said you will never leave us or forsake us, even to the end of the age. And, Lord, we can look forward to your wonderful, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And we will be able to go in and out of your temple and to spend time with you and to be in your presence, Lord. Lord, we have a... Now we see through a glass darkly, like we can't see everything as you want us to see. But then we will see everything, your plans and your purposes for us. 
So Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you search our hearts. You know us. And Lord, as we truly repent, Lord, and turn away, then you will pour out a blessing upon us. Amen. Well, if you've enjoyed our message today, and if it's been of any help to you, please like and share with your friends and family, because it's important days we are living in, and that we must God put God first in everything, and not worship our idol, worship idols. We must cast them out and get rid of them. And we must live poor, holy and pure lives before God. So, speak to you soon. I've enjoyed that today. I hope you have. May the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious unto you, and give you his peace and shalom. Amen.